Hey guys, here we are. It's uh, Jeff from Home Renovation DIY, joined today by my friend Brad from Fix This Build That. Brad, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing awesome, Jeff. I'm Appreciate you inviting you me. Channel. Stoked to have you on the channel today. This is so much fun. For everybody who doesn't know, Brad, um, Brad's been on YouTube for a while, and we've connected. We've been in the comments section of each other's videos. He actually sent me a birthday well wishing in, in video one day a couple years ago. And you know, um, we have never had a chance to connect. So I'm looking forward to meeting you this year. We're both going to be at the uh, VidCon Summit. Vid Summit, I think it's yeah. Vid Summit, yeah. I don't even know what these things are called. My <laughs> daughter does all that kind of stuff. You know, she keeps me apprised. But she's yeah, dragging me down this year. And uh, so we're going to have to go for dinner. And if things work out well, hopefully you can bring your lovely wife because I'll be bringing mine. That'd be fun. Yeah, absolutely. But guys, today the video is really all about, it's not about, you know, my man crush here. It's about... <laughs> We're talking here today about uh, I'm a I'm a DIYer. Um, I'm a visionary type renovation guy. I, I see a project and I can see it finished, and then I kind of work back from that point where to start. Brad's completely different, and this is why it's so much fun because I'm like, gotta have him on the show. Brad's an engineer. Now, am I right? You're a mechanical engineer. Yep. Okay. Turn YouTuber. That's why so not? Cool. Yeah, yeah. And because so when I watch your joke. videos, like. <laughs> You've probably seen it, guys. He does this video talking about vinyl flooring, right? And and his approach is so different than me. Like he, you actually, Brad, you mapped out the cuts, <laughs> like, <laughs> right? So you're the kind of guy that I've got people in my channel and in my membership, and and you're the kind of guy that they they need you <laughs> because I am not that guy. Oh, but yeah. I get guys asking me questions, and they'll send me eighty pictures, you know, and they'll ask me a question and I'm like, I am the wrong guy for this question. Cause I'm not an engineer. I just walk in and I'd kind of rough it and cock it. Yeah. But like, I'd be done by the time you have that model drawn up as it's, it's really funny because uh, I get, you know, it's one way or the other in the comment section. It's like, you're a complete idiot. Why would you like, you, why are you 3d modeling this? Like i have been done, you know, by the time you're done the model. And then the other ones are like, what is that software? That's amazing. Show me how to do this. You know? And, uh, yeah, you're probably right. It's just like two different personality types and mindsets of like, you know, tops down, bottoms up. So there is nothing you can do to change it. You're wired one way or the other. Yeah. Right. And so for folks who are wired that way, you know, I, I appreciate Brad. Brad, do you have a membership program on your channel? Uh, we do. We have a, we have a Patreon. You do Patreon. OK, that's awesome. And can people actually ask you questions and get advice if they need uh, it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Well, guys, listen, if you're hardwired like an engineer, then feel free to check out his channel. It's Fix This, Build That. Right? He's been around forever. He's got a, what, you what, 1.7, almost 1.8 million subs now? All right. Uh, 1.6, almost 1.7. Okay. So I'm, I'm snow plowing for you. That's okay. I, I like that. I, I like where your head's at. <laughs> it's coming. Listen, if, you're, if, if you are a DIY guy and you're on our channel and you're looking for that engineer touch, you need a little bit of engineer in your life and you're not familiar with this channel, then by all means, go and subscribe. Check him out. All right. He's worth the look and a listen. He's a smart guy. He's got lots of experience and he's got a new project. So let's talk about this. You put out a video, what, two days ago? Sunday yep. morning? Sunday morning. You got yourself some five acre property. You got yourself some trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got a 40 year old house with a gorgeous shop, which means the sky's the limit. Um, take me through this a little bit. Like what, what were you looking for? And is this check all of the boxes? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I see some people in the comments, they're asking, you know, so I'm, I'm notoriously not a Dr. Pepper drinker, but actually a Diet Mountain Dew drinker, but we ran out. So that, that's, <laughs> this is the empty can and that's the next one. That's I'm, what that is. Okay. <laughs> I've got a caffeine problem and I don't drink coffee. So it's. So you got a lot of your fans in the chat tonight. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you know, we've been looking for four over four years, and there, so we're in Nashville, and um, it's you know, like like anything, right? You have this list, and then the list kind of changes, and so the search has kind of changed over time. But yeah, we always knew we wanted like some land. I wanted a shop, and like right now, we're just like in suburbia, right? So it's like you know, I can open my window, reach out and uh, adjust my neighbor's shirt, you know, before he goes to work, uh, super close houses and HOA. And so we wanted to get out of that, wanted some land and we wanted a fixer upper, you know, we were talking a little bit about in the, in the pre-show. So we wanted some work because obviously, you know, like we've almost fixed up this entire house and, uh, you know, it's just like, I'm looking for projects. And so 
we wanted all those things and then having a shop that was at least built out you know walls framing everything uh and so yeah it, it actually did check all the boxes probably the only one that it didn't check was uh i would have loved to have been on sewer but we are on septic so you know this will be my first septic house so that'll be a new adventure it's it's not that big a deal to be I honest with you. nah you'll be fine your house is post building um building code so it would have been done correctly i'm sure you'll be just fine with that uh, it's a 1983 or 84, I think you said. Yep, 84. Very nice. So 40 years old. You know, on our channel, Brad, I, I preach to people, say, listen, you want to find something 40 years old, original condition, because it's after the building code, but it's ugly. Right. And so whatever work you put in, it's really good investment dollar, right? Yeah. that's it. And it's funny because I didn't, I didn't really think about that. So like uh, when I, I lived up in Cincinnati for a decade or so, and mm. uh, my first, the first house I bought was a 1907 with knob and tube. And yeah, and, and like, you know, and it was a two family, it was a single family converted into a two family. So you can imagine right. how that went. I, I remember when the first, we had our first tenant move out and, and I, sh and I shut the power down in the one unit. And then I got a call like a day later, like from the tenant that was still there. It's like, my fridge is powers out. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, there was like half a dozen plugs that were crossed on each one. I was like, okay. So yeah, it was, it was nice to, to not have to worry about knob and tube or aluminum wiring or any of those crazy things as best as, uh, yeah, that, yeah. That yeah. Can... That's the thing. Because if you, if you buy a post building code, all of those hazardous materials are removed from the production cycle. Yeah. Right. So it's a safe bet. Yeah. Around here, we have a joke because uh, the building inspectors tell me that 90% of all rental properties in the city of Ottawa were made without a permit. And so it's just a wild west, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. My goodness. Well, listen, guys, here's what the plan is today. We're going to talk about um, renovations. And, and right off the bat, the first thing is you're an engineer. It took you four years to find a piece of property. That sounds like an engineer shopping, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it does. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like when you look back, like hindsight's twenty twenty, right? And so you look back I'm like, oh, that property would have been great because, you know, like I said, the our kind of wish list changed a bit. We went from like, we want a fully finished place with a pool and, you know, and then enough space to do a, a shop. And then like, wow, well, you know, maybe and uh, then we look back hey, and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. at the beginning, you know, there's there's one property that kind of haunts us, but, it, you know, it's fine, whatever. It was 14 acres basically like the same house except a much larger lot and it was probably less than what we paid for this one because you know the last two years housing prices have gone through the roof well so. and that's the other thing right because you've been shopping for four years so you you've already doubled the price of your property <laughs> that's right <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> before we bought it <laughs> that's okay that's okay as long as there's inflation housing values keep going up they, they go right. together yeah so you'll be all right yeah okay well Let's talk about a couple of the problems you've had. And guys, if you're watching the show and you're wondering, hey, am I going to be able to call in today? We'll, we'll, we'll check that later. Um, but for now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, some of the issues that he's found at this property. And we weren't planning on this, just so you know. We, we made this call. We set this interview up a month ago. We put out um, our, our post a few days ago about how to renovate if you're like an engineer mind versus a DIYer. And then Sunday morning comes and the video comes out. He's got a new property. It's like, wow, that's just awesome. Now we can talk about his property. So we're going to spend the day talking about his. You've got some uh, significant issues. Let's talk first about the shop. That's exciting. Because yeah. that's going to be where you build your kitchen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, mean, I saw that you. Yeah, it's a post and beam construction. Yep. And I know you were like a little concerned because it doesn't look like traditional framing, right? Do you know when the shop was made? I don't, but I think it was it was uh, pretty close. It, it's I think the shop it may have been made at the same time. Like I'm, I'm thinking it was probably within the first five years of the house being built. Okay, so it was the same owner from way back when. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, here we go. So now you take a look at it from a from a structural engineer perspective. This is the advice I always get on the job site. If it's been here for 35 or 40 years. It'll do another 35 or 40 years if you don't touch it, <laughs> right. right? So when, it might look a little scary, but I was thinking, um, are you familiar with Kyle from RR Buildings? Have you yep. seen any of his content? Yep. Okay. You know, maybe reach out and say, hey, Kyle, can you take a look at my video and tell me, am I in trouble here or what should I do? Because 
you talked about earlier how uh, the, the weather, it changes. We were talking off camera earlier. And they used to get a lot more snow than they do now in Tennessee. But like the folks in Texas learned a couple of years ago, the wilder the weather cycles get, the more extreme they get. Yeah. What happens if you get a winter where you get that six feet of snow? Yeah. Is that what's in the back of your head? No, not in Tennessee. No. But, uh, <laughs> no, 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 well, no, ours, no, ours would be more like six inches of ice. <laughs> yeah, ours would be six inches of ice, not not six feet of snow. But uh, it, it is. And like, you know, when I was looking at it and I even said in the video, I, exactly what you said. I was like, well, it's been standing for 40 years. So, you know, whatever. And, yeah. And I think that it's uh, because it was the way it, it's structured. Uh, and I'm very familiar with Kyle's stuff, but it's like, you know, just the skin. So it looks even, you know, it's just got those what did you call them with the girders or whatever, but they've got those, you know, it's basically a two by four, two, two by fours in a T in yeah. between the made up six by sixes, which it's are, like the bare is, minimum to hold it together. Right. It is absolutely the bare minimum. Right. <laughs> and like, you know, you can, you can kind of shake it, but when it's all together, it's firm. And so what we're trying to decide is, uh, you know, the easy, but more cost prohibitive way to do it would just be to frame up, walls right frame up all because it's got actually a, a a concrete foundation so okay with eye walls and just go straight up onto that you know and just anchor in and and then it's, so it's big have, enough so that you're looking to maybe add interior walls as an exterior wall right right okay. exactly and then, and then it makes it makes wiring a breeze you know we Simple. can do we can you basically can do flash and back if we wanted to fix your acoustics for when you're filming and all that kind of thing Exactly. Exactly. Nice. So th that's kind of the way I'm thinking um, just because it'll be, and that's what I'm familiar with too. Like I used to frame houses when I was in, in college. Um, okay. So I'm very familiar with the, the framing setup and like for something that that's super easy. Um, yeah. Even if you make a mistake, it doesn't really matter. Right. It's not holding exactly. any load. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it was like nice. you know, a room within a room, um, which not that we need it, but it would also help with, you know, sound transmission and everything as well. Definitely um, will. Yeah. yeah. By the way, thought like your your little series you did on soundproofing, love that. I always go back to that one. People are what asking. Did that help me, you out? Yeah. Oh cool. yeah. I, was I love the panels you put on your ceiling, buddy. That was I can you had it was like you rolled out that like membrane type thing. I was like I've never seen that before. Uh, yeah, so. mass loaded vinyl. I, we don't have that in Canada, but the the company shipped it and we paid to get it brought across the border. Ah. That is a, that is a game changer. Uh, I I wish we had it. Yeah, because I was that looked kind so of cool. I was like, under, so yeah, you put that under flooring on your second floor of your house or something, and no one will hear you underneath. Yeah. So so yeah, that's that's kind of where we're thinking about it is is probably I'll do room within a room type construction, just put up new walls, 24 on center, nine foot tall, and uh and then close sell the uh basically close sell the whole frame. And then I'm thinking right. about you know how getting that. I don't do you have a um do you have a preference or do you uh with like an ERV HRV system for for something like that for like a wood shop where there's gonna be so much dust? Because I've got the dust collector and I won't wanna like be sucking in cold air, you know, all the time into that environment. So I was wanting to get a return in there. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting. So yeah, like are you talking like a like a like a heat pump kind of situation or something? Yeah, well just yeah, just like an exchanger. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, you know what? I, I would actually probably DIY my own filter around whatever intake you got. Uh huh. Just because you want to have two layers of protection. You know, because most of the filters that come with these systems are behind the grill. Yep. And so it's not in your face dirty. Right. So then if you put something up there that's pulling air and then you framed out a secondary screen so that it's in your face dirty, then you'd know when to change it. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. That visual. It's always good to have a visual. And that's why like when you go and check and I'm bad about it sometimes, like, I'll, and I'll write the dates on my furnace filters or my okay. uh, return filters. So you can and, kick yourself when you change it. Yeah. And I, I pull it out and I'll be like, Oh, I'm doing pretty good. This is only like, it's only been two months. Oh wait, 2021. My bad. <laughs> you know, I have a rule when I'm renovating, I change my furnace filter every week. Oh yeah. I and it, it, it would surprise you. It would surprise you. Just the, just the moving, the constant moving and, and laying down materials. And, and it's amazing how much dust you collect in a, in a, in a, in a building. 
Oh, I bet. So, yeah, having it, uh, having a program where you're every week you're changing it, or it's in your face dirty, so you know to change it. Mm -hmm. It's a game changer. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're waiting for the machine to make horrible sounds. <laughs> right, 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 right. And that's the wrong time to try to help out, right? Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. All right, well, talk to me. What's going on in your uh, crawl space? Because I was reading your comments on that video. You had some really interesting advice. Um, you've got a huge hill behind you. So every time it rains, the water comes down, sits underneath your home. It's uh, what kind of dirt are you on? Are you on clay up there? Uh, it yeah, it's probably mostly clay. I mean, we do have some decent topsoil. Um, I haven't been on the property long enough to know how it is, but we do have a lot of clay around here and we've okay. got a lot of uh, limestone also. So we hit okay. rock pretty, pretty soon, but there is, and I, cause I had a lot of those comments. It, it's actually what I think it is. And I'm sure that has something to do with it, but they actually do have a pretty decent um, swell on that hill to divert it. And there's actually a Creek to the left. Okay. But I think they've got, because uh, what the inspector told me was like, there's just a ton of exposed ducting. And so they're you're getting massive condensation off the ducting um, and that he thinks that's where the majority of the moisture is coming from. Okay. I understand. Huh. So then it's more about the way that you're moving water away from your building. Yeah. 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 So protecting it that way. And then also getting the, getting, you know, everything tightened up and, and that's what, so like, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like, so what these companies have told us and what we're planning to do is, um, uh, so right now we've got bat insulation you saw some of that in the video there. And, you know, it's just got mold on it. There's mold in the beam I mean, it's everywhere. And yep. so the idea is to take all that insulation out. Yep. And then, uh, deal with the mold, you know, spray and scrub and do whatever. I mean, you know, there's different ways that people have said to do it, but um, <laughs> that's what they're suggesting. And then, yeah. uh, and then go back in and encapsulate with a, uh, I think it was a 16 mil or a 10 mil. I can't remember barrier. I think we got quoted for both. Uh, seal that up all the way up to the sill plate, except not covering the sill plate. So they can do termite inspection and right. then put a, a big uh, dehumidifier in there. Right. So you, you need an electrician because you need a power source. You need a dehumidifier, maybe even with a, a small pump on it. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so then you're in the encapsulation process in the United States. I think markets almost 20,000 bucks, dude. Yeah, that's that's a big dollar. Yeah. And uh, wow. So that's a 40 year problem that developed. I would be more like. And that's that's encapsulating, not including mold remediation, <laughs> right? Negotiate that for sure. If they, have, yes. they, they push that high, it's hard to find trades. So the DIY solution, all right, is to go in there, pull all your insulation out, and actually sand all of them, all the uh, the moldy members down. It's just an eighty grit. Mm -hmm. You take up all the surface spores, right? You lay a ground sheet. You make sure you got lots of airflow so everything dries out, and then you treat it with a, a, a mold product like um, even bleach just to kill off all the surface. Because once the surface is cleaned up, like the mold comes from inside the wood. Right. That's what they're so saying. It's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the spores and the surface growth. That's what's really the problem. So when you sand it off, it's done. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Right? So And then you just treat the wood so that... It, it kills anything active on the surface that's left. Right. Well, now you can insulate again. So you can spray foam. And then all you got to do is make sure they keep the area dry. So if it's from ground, you can put down a ground sheet. And now you're not getting that moisture transfer from the ground into that humid environment. You're also, are you bricked right to the ground? Yes. Or concrete. Yeah. Concrete. Okay. Yeah. So you've got some rectangular vents and passive yep. air movement. Yep. If you have prevailing winds on one side of the building, generally speaking, on the other side, you can put in power fans in those passive vents and you can be pulling air, which will take all that moisture away. Mm. And that is a lot cheaper and simpler solution than doing an encapsulation. Right. If the encapsulation fails, you guarantee the moisture has nowhere to go but to rot your house out. Mm. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and so <laughs> if yeah. you're not doing it yourself, 
how much confidence do you have in the crew, right? Underground swimming pool. Man, that could well, be you know, and then the easiest thing is to just add a French drain around your perimeter of the house um, so that their water can't come from the hill or a downspout and get underneath your, your space. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and you know, they, they did a little bit of that work because he was telling me about the, the previous owner was telling me about some of the things they'd done. And he was actually in irrigation. So he was like, oh, yeah, we got a curtain drain over here to the shop and this and that. So, yeah, I feel pretty good about that. And we just had some really good rains here. And it didn't seem like it was more, you know, like around them. I didn't jump under the, the crawl space because it's crawl space. Okay. Is, so it didn't create like an, an obvious dramatic moment where like, no, no, definitely not like standing water. Right. Sure. So, well, and that's well, the biggest issue. Okay. So the groundwater is always going to be there. It's always going to be coming up, you know, and, and, and trying to balance the humidity level in that airspace with the right. water content in the ground. If you've got clay, you're holding water there all the time. Yeah. So it's always a higher concentration. It's always a concentration that will cause mold. So the secret is to have air moving that's drier on a regular basis. So yeah. all that moisture is leaving. And a couple of those fans is all you really need. Yeah. So like it's, uh, I, I did the same thing. I've got that trailer in Florida and I had a company come out and said, so what did we do to fix the moisture level down here? They did 20,000 bucks encapsulation. I'm like, you want to spend 25% of the value of this whole building uh -huh. on, on a technology. I said, how about we just put in a couple of fans? <laughs> oh, well, my goodness. Yeah, we're, we're definitely looking through the, the different options. I actually saw one guy. It was crazy. I don't know if uh, I forget what the channel is called. So symbol, something silver symbol, something like that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that guy. Yeah. Did you see the uh, what he did? And he spray foamed. His, he spray foamed the gravel. Okay. So instead of putting down a barrier, they yeah. spray foamed the entire, uh, everything. Basically and, becoming a, um, uh, a closed cell insulation vapor barrier spray foam. Yep. Yeah, you could do the same thing with a heavy sheet of plastic. Yeah. Just put I, I plastic crazy. Plastic, you know? I mean, they just went like literally right on top of gravel. I was like. Yeah. That is so now, weird. Nowadays. Is hard on top yeah. of them. New technology and new house construction is actually to try to achieve this net zero concept. They're talking about you build your walls, you spray foam the gravel, you spray foam up the wall, and then you put in the the, the basement floor. Oh. Right? Huh. And so you've got a complete encapsulation system that's thermal break. It's yeah. got no thermal break, and the moisture can't come through. And, well, who knows? I mean... That's kind of crazy. I mean, it's there's, there's, like, oh, I can see the benefits of that. There's but, lots um, of ways to solve a problem right, and right. Uh, that are really expensive. Yeah, exactly. I, that would be I probably like to more. focus on, you know, you got a 40 year problem that developed some mold issues in the house. So that took a long time to get there. Yeah. What if a couple of $30 fans could keep the relative humidity down so it wasn't necessary to spend that money? So you call in a company, they come in underneath, and instead of you crawling around sanding everything, they'll just come in there, they'll soda blast it, right? And, and they'll, they'll peel off all the old mold, gone, dead, right? They do like a dry ice soda blast kind mm -hmm. of concept, right? Mm -hmm. And then they can treat the wood. You're starting from scratch. You get a ground sheet, you throw in a couple of fresh air vents, and monitor the relative humidity for a few weeks and see if you win. Because if you can right. keep your relative humidity below the point where mold will grow, Problem solved. No need to spend the extra money, right? Right. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. Take it one step at a time. Because if you can manage the relative humidity, then you don't have a problem. Just writing this down, Jeff. I'm over here taking notes. So yeah, That's okay. You, you can actually watch this on replay. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, I mean, uh, I there's no way I could spend $20,000 fixing a problem that took like 40 years to develop. Yeah. I just couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Yeah. And then, you know, that's, that's like the worst place to spend money too. Right. Is like where you don't see it. It's like, right. I want to spend yeah. that 20 grand in the bathroom and in the kitchen and making things that you're going to get your value back for. Well, that's it. That's it. Well, you know, the deal right now, uh, every dollar that you spend fixing your own house there, Brad, you're going to make four. That that's is the market. that high. Wow. That is the market. Yeah. Yeah. That is the market now. 
It used to be that way in Canada because our housing was so expensive, relatively speaking. But now almost every market in the United States is almost, some of them are still tight, you know, $3 return. Or if you're in a small town in Mississippi, maybe $2 return. You mm-hmm. can double your money. But in uh, out in the country in Nashville and a big piece of property, yeah, you can, you can go four times. And that's tax-free money, right? Uh, yeah. So that's like eight times money. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> like, that's just crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, so what's going on? You, you wanted to rip out your wall between your living space and your kitchen? Yeah. yeah. You confirm you've got trusses in that house? Mm-hmm. Okay. So then that means um, all of those walls are just interior walls. They're not, they're not carrying any load. Yeah. So you have live load and snow load, but you don't have snow. That's right. <laughs> So you really don't have a problem. <laughs> Up here in Canada, if we have a truss roof on a one-level house, we can rip out all the interior walls, and there's no consequence. Other than the cosmetic issues, you got to change all your ceiling and all your flooring. Right, right, right. But yeah, that'll work out well. Yeah, um, I'm excited to, to see where – because it's like one of those where – so we've, we've got the, you know, uh, eight-foot ceilings. and. Yep. And then we've got these like narrow, the narrow hallway. So it's, you know, it's kitchen, eat in kind of family room, you know, big room, whatever great room you want to call it. And then three bedrooms in the back and a bathroom. Right. Right. In this weird mechanical room. So we're, we're trying to decide, you know, how do we, how far back do we want to go like on that opening it up and making it <clears throat> to make it have there? Or like I was telling you before the, the show, going the other way on the garage and potentially, scooting into the garage and extending that crawl space that way to try to get some more um, footage for, you know, basically just living space to have. So it's so that there's another space other than like being in your bedroom or being with everybody else, right? Like have another little nook where the kids could go and watch TV or game or do whatever. Got it. Yeah. That's tough. That's tough. But yeah. You know, so are you considering doing an addition to that house? We are. Yeah. Is it, does the ground elevation, you know, present you issues with that or are you no, going to be okay? Not, no, we're, we're good because we have, um, eh, we have, we have plenty of room before because like the, the shop is set back maybe 75 feet uh, or so from, okay. from the house. And then yep. the grade starts um, kind of about midway through the shop, but it's real, it's real gentle. And then about 20, about 40 feet past the shop, it, it takes off. Okay, so let me throw this at you then. If you're going to do an addition, you don't have to do it in the same construction technology. You don't have to do crawl space. Okay. Okay, what you can do is you can go with helical pile. Have you seen this technology? No, I'm it's not. A, it's a pipe with a huge saucer auger bit on the bottom. Okay. Right? And what they do is they do point load helical piles. They'll carry a steel beam across it, and they'll go engineered floor trussing like 25, 30 feet all the way back to the original house. Mm-hmm. They sheet the underside with pressure treated plumbing, uh, plywood, sorry, spray foam. They can add your heat and air conditioning ducting inside that unit as well. Run all your electrical, you know, then you spray foam that sucker in, right? And you can build right on top of that. And you can build that off your house to the helical pile points that carry all that load and transfer it back and just leave it open underneath so you don't trap any moisture. Huh. Yeah, it open like do you skirt it though on the? I mean, you can you're... skirt it and give yourself some privacy. You know, um, whether you wanted to use some sort of a material that doesn't have any weathering effect or whatever, but uh, you don't have to go with bricking it all in and then just having a few little rectangle slots and then hope you get enough passive air. Right, right, right. Dirty, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. If I leave, I'm in Tennessee, so if I leave it open, we're gonna have two dens of possum, three squirrels. Well, and there you go. Right, team, so. So you're gonna want to at least put up uh, maybe maybe at least some cedar lattice or something, yeah. right? Frame it all in, yeah. Right. But uh, that's the idea. So like, even if you have your elevation changing, you don't have to pour all your footings and then brick it all in and everything else. You can really, you can really go Rambo and come have it come flush right off your existing flooring. Oh, wow. I have to look into that. Yeah. I've not seen that before. Yeah. That's what we use. We use it in four season climate. They take that helical pile all the way down to below the frost line. Mm -hmm. And they actually have technology. Now they'll be able to tell you how much load it can handle. And so the engineer will say, this is what load requirement is if we're doing this point and this point. And they'll just go down until they get that load and then they cut it off. Wow. Yeah. So depending on your soil conditions, um, but if you've got clay mix up there, you can take all kinds of load on clay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's a great (laughs) solution for doing an addition quick on the cheap. 
Yeah, that, that is the one bright side of clay, I guess. <laughs> yeah. That's about it. The only one. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. Well, listen, it's 530. If you if you want, um, let's take a look at the comment section here. Matt yeah. has been paying attention and making some notes. We'll see what everybody's got to ask about your project. And love to know about your process, how you go through this. What kind of projects does this guy do? So Tyler is not familiar with your channel. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I should have uh, introduced myself. But uh, yeah, so we do woodworking. We started basically with woodworking, building furniture, building out the shop and basically anything inside the house. And then slow, actually, one of the yeah, that wasn't one of the first, but it, it was pretty early on that vinyl plank flooring was one of the first you know forays into into home DIY and home renovation. And, you know, you know how that video went. So we're like, that seems like a good idea. Let's do more of that. So now it's, right? it's, it's true. And, but that was the idea of the channel from the beginning. That's why it's called fix this, build that. So it's like, you know, fixing the water heater and then building the table. Uh, so yeah, we do, we do basically anything from woodworking to building a, a retaining wall outside or a fire pit to, you know, building a secret hidden room behind, you know, a bookcase or something. I, I love that project, by the way. That was yeah. brilliant. That was brilliant. One of these days we'll have to have some fun like that. Oh, anyway, I love the secret. Oh. All right, Maddie, we got a uh, hidden user. So, you know, sh just a question <laughs> for Brad. What level of projects are too small to plan in depth? Yeah, so that's it, Brad. When do you turn off the engineer? Never. Ever? <laughs> no project is too small to plan. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's like one of those things where, uh, you know, you got to like the just do it, right? And then you got the planning. And think like anytime for me, anytime like I'm gonna make a run to the lumber store, I, I'm gonna plan it in some form or fashion because I want to know like how much material I need. I don't want to get too much. I don't want to get too little. Uh, so you know, if it's you know replacing the faucet, I'm not gonna obviously plan that. I'm just get the stuff and going. But as soon as you start like getting in materials and you have to have a lot of inputs coming into the project. I always find I'm like, okay, let's, let's budget it out. Let's figure out, you know, how much we're going to need and go out and get it so that I know what I'm getting into before I dive into it. Oh, that is so not me. <laughs> I actually, I have a box and I have a corner. And so I always overbuy. I anticipate problems and I bring the solution in advance based on experience on the job. And then anything I don't need, I throw it in the corner. And yep. when the corner gets too full, then I do a return day. <laughs> oh, I, I do this thing when I, when I like, I, <laughs> I always have this uh, this thing where I'm telling people for plumbing, they're like plumbing. I said, listen, plumbing, no matter how small the job or how big the job, it's mm. mandatory three trips. Like mandatory. It's one of those things, right? It, yeah. it is. I could be like, I and, and you know, I, I've been doing plumbing like, because I owned rentals back up in Cincinnati that had that two family and I had another property. And and so I had a lot of plumbing things that I'd fix. And I fixed a lot of plumbing in my days, but still, and I feel like I have a pretty good feel for how everything fits together. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It's still like you know, you'll, you'll screw one up or you'll, you know, need a 45 versus a 90. And I'm like, but I'll do the same thing, Jeff. I'll go in. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, okay, I need two of these. I'm getting four of those. I need, you know, three of these. I'm getting six of those. Oh, and I don't need any of those, but I'll get two of those anyway. And I'll still right. I'll be like. I, I'm like, I love point. couplings. I love couplings. <laughs> I'm, I'm coupling crazy. <laughs> I have a huge, I have a huge bin of copper couplings. My, uh, uh, stepfather-in-law, he was a, a contractor for a while and he gave me this bin. And it was just like all these like slip couplings and nineties and, and like half and three quarter copper. So I, I am good on those. Nice. That's good. It's nice to have supplies, but it seems like no matter how much I hoard my supplies, I'm always missing the one thing that I need. The one little thing. Oh, uh, So yeah, for me, I always uh, attack my day with three or four projects in mind. So I'll, I'll just work until I get stopped because I'm missing something. And then mm. I'll just hit the other project until it stops me. So yep. then I can go shopping for all four of the things that I'm uh, not. That's a good <laughs> way to do it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm single threaded. I'm yep, all not trips. surprised. Look at that. All right. <laughs> Let's get another question, Matty. Um, just so everybody knows, my son, Matt, back in Ottawa, taking care of the questions tonight, loving the StreamYard platform, makes this kind of thing possible. Um, <laughs> any advice on balancing home projects with working full-time, wife, kids, without going crazy? Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, I just learned how to come back from crazy. But uh, <laughs> what's what's your what's your work life balance like? Is there such a thing? Uh, 
you know, that, that I hear people write, it's like, there is no such thing as work like balance when you own your own company. Uh, and I, I, I tend to agree with that. And I know like some people can set things aside and separate. I cannot, like I'm sitting in my office right now, which, you know, my kitchen's right over there with my three kids and my wife. Uh, and so it's very hard for me to separate it. But what I found, like, especially when I was working for the full-time job, like, like this uh, fella is, when I was working the full-time job and doing that, it, like you have to compartmentalize things so that you can make the time. But that's mm. what I always just, the thing that I, the thing that gave was, was my sleep. Right. And so maybe that's like going crazy, but that, I would always, you know, I'd get up in the morning, drive off to work, work, you know, the eight to five and then uh, hour drive home. So I'd get home at six and then hang out with the kids from like six until eight, put them down, spend a little bit of time with my wife and then go into the shop at nine and I'd stay there till midnight or like one. And that was like every, like, that's how I built the channel was by just burning the candle at both ends <clears> of the stick. And yeah. yeah, like not, not super healthy, but uh, it's, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to try to do it all, you know, or you can short change because there was a point in time too, where when we were like, okay, I think we can do this, this YouTube thing sounds pretty cool. And it's like, yeah, but, <laughs> I've got an engineering salary. So like, how do we replace that with YouTube? And yeah. we decided like we, we actually sat down with the kids. I sat down with the kids and you know, my wife and I obviously talked about it first and we were like, Hey guys, like dad is like, we're, here's what we're trying to do. And so he's going to really be like mm. pushing hard to make sure we can do this. So like for the next six months, like I'm not going to be available all the time. And so you're probably going to see less of dad, but it's because in 12 months, you're going to see a lot more of that, you know, and like making that sacrifice up front. So, you know, kind of like that too. It depends on if you're just doing it for a hobby or if you're actually doing it as a business, like if you're doing it as a business, you're trying to go full time. You got to make sacrifices. It's just, or it. it's going to take a lot of time. It is a, it's a, it's an entrepreneur spirit, regardless of yeah. whether you're, whether you're an engineer minded or not. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a sacrifice to make this thing work. Without a doubt. I'm, I was, uh, I, I was blessed. My kids were all grown up. When I started, last well, seven years, well, they were 18, uh -huh. 18 and up. I'm an old guy, right? And I started yeah. young. So I got uh, I got lucky that way. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I was contracting for years running my own business. It was the same thing. You know, if I wanted to take time off to fo coach my kids football, that meant that I was missing hours on the job. Yeah. And it was like, okay, so, but you sacrifice that because, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's the wife. It's the kids first before everything else. Yep. If you can find a way to be successful and rich, then all the power to you. But don't destroy your family in the meantime. Yep. Yeah, My goodness. Yeah, there you go. Right? Because, uh, you know, it, it doesn't always work out. So it's nice to have right, someone yeah. who wants to see you around. That's right. <laughs> Hit me up, Maddie. Let's get another question in here. Do you have any career advice for new mechanical engineers to get a job fresh out of college or, oh, and or find a new job that you enjoy? There we go. <laughs> the engineering job. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I, I'm not that far behind you, Jeff. Uh, so I graduated from college in 2000. Okay. And, and back then it was like the land of milk and honey, you know, like the jobs are just falling off of trees and it was, it was great. So when, <laughs> I don't know if I have nice. any advice for you. I mean, nice. But we were able to also did in, in college, actually, I, I think a really uh, great program if, your school has it wherever you're going to school is a co-op program. So I did that and I actually turned a four-year degree into a five-year degree by adding a year of work in and going mm -hmm. basically full-time after I, my sophomore year, I think. Uh, and so that's a great way to, to also be able to like kind of sample businesses, get a feel for the real world. And I love the second part of his question was like, uh, or find a, I like how he said, or find a, a new job that you really love. And that's exactly where I was. I was like, you know, engineering can be great. And I should do that because I'm good at math and science and, uh, and it's good money. And then I kept chasing. I was like, well, I don't really like this one. I'll get a new job. I don't like this one. I'll get a new one. I don't really like this one. And climbing the ladder and making more <clears> money <throat> was awesome. But in the end, I realized like that, that was not, I mean, it took me 17 years to figure it out, but you know, that's, that's uh, part of the part of life too. And mm. uh, so it took me that long to figure it out. Uh, if you're going in already knowing that you're not going to enjoy it, I would recommend to start that journey quicker, 
right? And and not you know, because like and I know I have lots of friends who like love engineering. They just like I mean they're you know sitting up at night like solving linear equations and stuff. Like they're all about it, and that's awesome. Yeah. But if you're just doing it because like it's a good paying job and you know somebody said they thought you'd be a good engineer that's that's not going to last that long and that's what happened to me so i wish i had have gotten into it i mean you know there, there's lots of pros and cons of doing it later in life like you know we you know i was an engineer for 17 years so we were able to you know buy a house and like i might have my wife stay at home like if i'm a youtuber like my wife's not staying at home raising the kids while i'm working a youtube job like that's not going to happen at least not starting out <laughs> Not, not for a little while anyway. That's right. Yeah. No kidding. My goodness. Yeah. Great question. Wow. Yeah, because it doesn't matter if you're an engineer, right? I mean, there's still that, are you wired to be an employee? Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's fast food restaurant or an engineer or a doctor. Are you wired to be an employee? Yep. People who aren't, you're just going to be miserable and changing jobs for the rest of your life. So if you're not wired, my best advice is, Take 10 years to get good at something. Suck it up, Nancy, because you're not going to like your boss. Don't bother switching it around all the time. Be consistent and learn from people who've come before you. And then take that years of experience and try to put your money aside so that you can do what's going to bring you joy. But, man, yeah. you are going to learn everything the hard way if you don't have a training season. You know, business and being an entrepreneur it's not all it's cracked up to be in the beginning. You don't yep. have to learn everything the hard way. So learn some of the stuff the easy way first. Yeah. Right. <laughs> now, the flip side is you could also just be a YouTuber and, you know, make all your mistakes on camera and, and entertain. Well, yeah, there nobody's them. looking and then nobody ever comments. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That is awesome. All right. Let's get back into the questions here. Oh man. How do you determine whether a certain project needs more engineering and planning AK time versus just get in there and get it done? Yeah, how do you? Or you you just always do more engineering and more yeah, planning. No, I mean, it's, I think it's also like if it's a plug and play, right? If it's a okay. plug and play, it's easy. If you're just like replacing, like I replace my water heater. I yes. spent a lot of time figuring that out. I just, no, like, that's I, an installation project we call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I like that terminology, right? If you're, you're, pulling, you're, you're replacing a faucet, you know, you're one for one replacing something. If you're yeah. adding something new, you're, you're trying to fit a specific space or you have other uh, requirements that you just want things to do. You want it to be stronger, you know, than the last whatever bench you made or that was mm. in there. Like those things, like figure, that's what I think it is, like figuring out what do you want out of it? And if it requires more strength or more flexibility, like it's gonna take, I, I would sit down, me personally, of course, sit down and like really plan out what you want out of it versus if you're just replacing a new, countertop a new refrigerator whatever you just you know that's just do it that's interesting so when you're when you're planning a project do you ever get to a place where you say okay that's it i have the plan and it doesn't change again or no really no. yeah oh yeah yeah no I, I so i'm still like flexible i'm and more so i'm uh um <laughs> I'm just like undecisive. So like I get, and I'm like, you know what? It would really be cool. So it's like, I'll think of something and then I'll be like, change my mind. And be like, well, no. And then, you know, always you have the things that come up on the job uh, that change your mind for you. So mm. yeah, no, I'm not afraid to change my mind. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in the shop like this. Right. <laughs> Staring and being like, what do I do next? <laughs> so in, uh, in Canadian football, we had a player called Michael, the pinball Clemens. And he was short and he had very low center of gravity. Mm -hmm. And the way that he ran the ball was every time he was going to get hit, his feet would both come off the ground and he'd bounce off of somebody and he'd just keep running. And so he'd go like this up the field. Uh -huh. That's how I do my jobs. <laughs> I got a plan. I just start going forward. And when I take a hit, it's like, well, that's the new plan then. And just keep yep. on going. Right. <laughs> I don't, I don't plan out anything pretty much. Yep. I, uh, my goodness. That's hilarious. All right. Maddie, let's have another one, bud. Okay, do you have any tips on meshing DIY with contractor work? All right, this is interesting because you're doing some of that now, right? So he's yeah. a 2015 yeah. home in Alberta looking to finish the basement. A lot of our community are like, I'm comfortable doing this and this, but I need to hire someone to do this and this. Um, it sounds like, you know, you're in the midst of that right now. Yeah. Have you, have you done that kind of stuff before? Uh, yeah, so, and that is a great question, right? Because as a, as a DIYer, 
or as a cheapskate, which, you know, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, <laughs> you, I've never like, considered save, that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, I want to save all the money. Right. Right. But, right. Uh, I think the biggest thing is time and how much time, like if you're willing to stretch a project mm. out for as long as it takes to do it as cheaply as possible, I'd do everything. And I, I know a lot of people are, like scared of like electricity or gas or plumbing. Like I, I do it all. I don't care. Um, yep. because like, I know the, the safety precautions and that kind of stuff. So for me, it's always a question of time versus money. Uh, and so, you know, what are the, especially if there's something that multiple projects are hinging on, then mm. I'll be like, okay. <clears throat> and one thing I used to, you know, like whenever I watch you, Jeff do like drywall, I'm always like, if I could do drywall like that, I'd, I'd do it myself. But I'm like, I've, I've never actually paid somebody to do drywall, but in my mind, the next time I need it, I'm going to pay them because <laughs> I get it. But like, you see, you've got a wife and you know, kids and you've, and your, uh, your time has a value, right? So yeah, if, in the DIY world, if you're going to learn a new skill and say, I'm going to tackle the wiring, is this the only time you're ever doing it? Yeah. And then, then what's the point? Like there's more risk than reward there. But if yeah. you're going to learn how to do wiring so that, because you're planning on flipping a house every three to five years for the rest of your life and having that skill is going to save you a hundred thousand dollars over the course of your life. Well then it's, it's worth it to learn how to wire. Yeah, but well, that, yeah. I love that. I love that because actually that makes me think of like what I always give people uh, advice when they're asking of like, you know, I do a lot of like tech stuff, right? And they're like, you know, should I spend time to like automate this, right? And so maybe, you know, even in, in your own business, when you think about it and from my mm. corporate world, they there's this thing that I learned back then that is like really helpful. It's like when you look at something, you have to categorize it. Like what's the, what's the frequency you're going to do it? So if you spend 15 minutes every single day doing something yep. right, forever, then yep. it's worthwhile to spend 10 hours fixing it. But if yes. you do it 15 minutes once a quarter, it's not worth eh. that same 10 hours. Eh. Right? So I love that. I love how it, how it, how what you said, you know, it's like, well, if you're, you know, and I, it's I like getting that's... stuck in traffic. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But electric, like I think, you know, like I feel like every homeowner should know how to change light switches, lights, outlets because like that stuff's you know because you're going to be doing that through the life yeah and they break you they own. actually break mm -hmm. and you yeah. know try to find an electrician nowadays who's going to come in and do one little project like that good I, luck i i, I want to ask you this because i know you've seen a lot more houses than i have but mm. my my daughter um she she came in to her room and like hit on the wall or i don't know she may have like slammed the door because she was mad or something but she's a sweet girl so I, I, it happens I don't, don't worry like, about it i have four happened. yeah no judgment here. <laughs> there's a there's a double switch. Light yeah. Her light was on. Her fan was off. So it's like this. Pic picture falls down. Yep. And snaps off the toggle switch. The toggle. Yes. Just snapped it. Just sheared it right off. Yep. I have never seen that before. And I'm like hit. I was like. And then the funny thing was, and, and like you know, for my whole time I've owned a house and stuff, never seen that. Um, and then two weeks later, the fan was on, and she she cracked off the other one too. So. That was awesome. We just had like a bad batch of switches or something, but I was like, no, what, never seen what you've got is when you're taking a look at the light switches and receptacles, it's actually two components, right? There's, there's the mechanical and there's the electrical yep. and they, they stick them together and the, and the connection's all plastic. And so it doesn't take a whole lot. If you have a loose wire and create too much heat, they start to separate. Mm. Or if you have uh, any kind of uh, an impact force on the one, it'll just shear it right off the other. Yeah. Right. And so they're incredibly, um, not durable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you can even be, be trying to plug something in too many times and get too much resistance and just rip the face right off of a, of a plug. Um, if it's had too much heat, it, it'll yeah. just rip right off the wall. Yeah. And there's live power that, sitting yeah. there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Got any so, uh, anything back there. Knowing how to, you know, flick that breaker, pull a couple of screws, rewire that sucker, put it back in again. Yeah. Um, or what you leave the breaker off. You don't have lights in your kid's bedroom for two weeks waiting for an electrician to spend 20 minutes at your house. That's right. And then that's a $500 bill because yep. he charges a trip charge both charge. directions. <laughs> I got to get the tools. I would, I got to set up. I got to wear my yep. booties so I don't scratch your hardwood floor. Cause I don't want to be liable for scratching your floor. All of that. Yep. Right. So yeah, learn, learn how to do some basic stuff. The world is changing. If you own a home, you've got to become competent with some of these systems. Mm -hmm. It's worth learning. Absolutely. Oh, save you a fortune. <laughs> All right. Maddie, what's going on? Let's get another question here. 
Beautiful. Rob, two of my favorite creators in the same video. Cheers, Brad. Got those hats yet. <laughs> Loving it. There you no. go. And so <laughs> Brad's got the merch. He's licking and sticking it. I got office, the merch. Right? <laughs> yes. if, 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 I, if, I, if this is the fellow who I think it is, he's been uh, hammering me for, you know, the last two years. Like, when are you going to get new hats in? When are you get new hats? And I've been like, I love they're it. Coming, they're coming. They're coming. But yes, the hats yeah, are coming. Have been now. <laughs> it is hard, eh? When you're, when, you're, when you're trying to put out content on a consistent basis to also be working on the business side of this business. It, yep. it, there's a lot of angles, man. It's like you're trying, you're trying to fish and farm at the same time. <laughs> yeah. It's just really brutal. Yeah. Oh. Well, you've done a good job of, of building out a team. And I, I love, I love that. It's the family too is, is awesome. That's one yeah. thing. You know, my kids are younger, but we're, we're kind of like sowing the seeds of like, Hey, you know, and I've been trying to see like, are they into editing? Are they into, <laughs> You know, what are they into so we can... Like, what are the proclivities, right? Yeah, I get yep. it. Yeah, yep. that's awesome. No, we're really, uh, we're really blessed. My, uh, my daughter's a, uh, she's a, she's a sharp cracker. So she's our CEO. Yeah. And, um, and her fiance was a firefighter. And uh, Rick took on the challenge, said, listen, I want to, I want to be a part of this. I love how we're helping people. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. And so he's become our channel manager. And talk about a growth curve to go from firefighter to YouTube channel manager, right? Right. And and we were like, you know what? I don't care if it takes two, three, four years. Um, his heart's in the right place, and he's going to be. He's he's diligent. He's conscientious. He's going to become the best channel manager in YouTube history. And I know the people around me aren't going to cause me any disruption or pain, yeah. right? I never have to have that in my, in my, like looking over my shoulder feel. Right. right. Yeah. So it's awesome. And then I've got yep. Matt's joining me now. He's finished his business school. He's working on the tools with me right now. We're going to train him up on how to be a uh, house renovator. So he can turn that into a career, whether he stays on camera with me or not. Yeah. I want him to have that skill because the world's going to be in short demand. Oh, and yeah. if he can become uh, a skilled craftsman, then he's going to make, he's got life. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, anyway. Oh my goodness. I could talk about my kids all day, but we're not here to talk about them. <laughs> Let's get another question. Jacob, concerns of oil versus shellac primer. He does cabinet refinishes, health concerns, durability. Is that is that is that something that's in your purview of expertise? Do you do enough for finishing work that you can I, speak to that? I don't, I don't, but I've um I think there's one, um, there's definitely one advantage of shellac is just it's so, so fast, you know, you yeah. can put that on there. You can build up a few codes. That's, I, I really like the, um, I think it's Zinsser one, two, three, that they have a shellac primer. And if you're doing do. finishing cabinets or doing that, it'll seal in the, the smells and the stains and the sap, you know, from, if you're doing pine or something that has some, some sap out of it, that's, I really like that one, but I don't know that it has any technical advantages over the oil. It, but as far as application, it's a lot faster. Right. At the end of the day, my, my thoughts on these kinds of products are simple. Um, if you're sensitive to the VOCs or smells or you have autoimmune issues, then just get a really kick-ass mask. Right. <laughs> but once the stuff all dries, it's perfectly safe. And in a lot of cases, the more toxic up front, the more durability you get. Yep. Right. Like we suffered for years in the 80s and 90s with trying to get, remove oil products from the market. And we had to go to latex and water base, but the technology wasn't there. Right. So it's taken almost 40 years to get the latex products to the point where it's like, hey, we can use these outside and not have to do it every bloody year. You right. know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I love me some good old fashioned toxicity because that stuff works, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like that should be a new shirt, the Home Revision DIY. I love me some good toxicity. I love me some good toxicity. Because <laughs> it works. <laughs> Bring on the VOCs, baby. <laughs> <laughs> love it. All right, Roberto. Hey, I'm a newcomer in Niagara Falls. Uh, we, we don't know if that's US or Canada. What's the best place to learn the trades and start working? Wow. Oh. I don't know. Brad, is that for me? Maybe. <laughs> I, you're, not for me. Cause I don't know. I, I, I tell you what, I, I know that uh, around here, they're all hiring, right? Everybody's like, hiring. Everybody's hiring. So I don't know how like the, you know, for certain trades, how the apprentice program goes and how, 
you know, what uh, yeah. certifications or anything that you need to get the job. But I do know, you know, especially even if it's like a, a one trucker, you know, like they're hiring, everybody's looking for, for help. Okay, so here's here's the basic gist, guys. If you're looking to get in the trades, you need the following: you need uh, uh, you need steel toe boots. <laughs> you need you need a hard hat. You need to go and research um, your your safety uh, training facility in your city. Okay, because you're going to want to get what we call up here WIMIS. It's a mater hazardous materials training, mm -hmm. all right? And you're going to want to get your fall protection training, and you're going to want to get a course on how to use a ladder because all of these things you need to have a certificate in your pocket. And then you can go to any job site anywhere in the country and say, Hey, I got certified. You guys want me. And they will, they will buy you lunch and hire you on the spot. All right. As long as you're employable, if you put in the effort to get the certifications, you're employable in a heartbeat. Mm. But if you're trying to find someone to spend the money to train you, right. they don't know if you're good on the job. And there's usually a very small window of time. I can't remember exactly what it is, but I think they have something like 60 or 90 days to train their new employees on those proper procedures. Word to the wise, if you're new in the trades, get trained first. It could save your life. I like The that. most dangerous thing on a job site is the new guy. <laughs> yeah, the new guy yeah. with the gold blade. <laughs> it ain't the tools or if you wear safety glasses. It's the new guy who doesn't know what he's doing. That's yeah. the most dangerous part of a job site. So get trained, and then you'll find all kinds of opportunities open up to you. Because if they, you'll, you'll see a job ad and they'll be like, hey, I need a couple of the guys doing this. You can call up and say, hey, I'm not skilled, but I'm trained and certified or on my safety and I've got my equipment. Would you teach me? You'd be surprised how fast they might say yes. When I was learning in trades, forget about it, right? You had to basically say, hey, I'm going to come and push a broom for free and learn. And if I impress you, maybe you'll start paying me in a couple of months. Right. It was brutal. But times have changed. Anyway, let's get something. Let's get a different question up here. And then uh, hope there's no more hidden skulls in Brad's new house. <laughs> Maybe under that crawl space. <laughs> there might, I'm actually, you know, being a, being a YouTube content creator, I'm hoping there are. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm like, yeah, right. Like, I'm it's, it's nice. Office and I, was talking, I gotta like, be honest. Like, Part of me said, I bet he threw that up there just for <laughs> I, I, did that. I, I did. I did. So, you know, it's like, you know, we you want to make videos ethically, right? Or at least I do, and I'm sure you do too. But uh, I was like, I was like, you know, do do you go back up there and kind of recreate the scene? Because it was I didn't touch it. I still haven't. It's still there. Uh, but the first time I, I climbed up there, I was like, oh, and I was like, should I read? You know, should I? And I was like, no, I'll just say like I saw something up there, which I did. And then I was like, you know, so it's like, yeah, I hope. I was talking to my editor and I was like, I really hope there's something interesting when I rip the walls of that office down to see if there's just like, you know, who knows what's inside. Right. Like, a, like some rat skulls or something. <laughs> something. Yeah. You, you, know, you always want the unexpected when you're doing a video just to, so you can add some, uh, you know, add some flavor into it. Well, that's cool. Actually, you got, you got a fair amount of uh, free tools out of that gig, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Did you try yeah, that band saw yet? A, he left a few. Uh, I, it actually, the, the thing I'm probably most excited about is that big metal vice. It was like a, I don't know, oh, it was like huge, nine or twelve yeah. inch. Or, yeah, I was like, oh yeah, that's we'll take that. <laughs> that's some good old fashioned tool, man. That'll be awesome. All oh, right. Yeah. Well, listen, it's uh, it's six o'clock. We got a few minutes. Um, if you are in the trades, all right, and you wanted to give us a call because you've got any suggestions that you could put forward to help Brad with his renovation project or deal with his moisture and mold issues, then I'm going to invite you to call. But only if you're in the trades and you got some great advice for him. Okay, let's let's keep the conversation really muted today. Um, Matt, maybe you can put up a banner and put the phone number out there. <laughs> Otherwise, I got it right here. Yeah, I've always got my special phone number in my pocket. It's uh, <laughs> 343. Look at that. Matt's way ahead of me. Okay, beautiful. All right. Yeah. So if you're in the trades and you've got some wonderful advice, I, I don't know everything. I, I know a lot about a lot, but I don't know everything. Here's my phone. I'm ready to go. Uh, otherwise, let's just jump into another question. We'll see if anybody calls up with some advice about your crawl space. Awesome. Uh, I have eight foot dead man support walls in my basement. Why? What's a dead well, man? Well, yeah, them. basically they're not carrying anything. Oh. It's because you can't run wiring unless you've got 
framing that you can put a hole in the middle of the frame through to protect it from screws when you finish the space. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Okay. Yeah. Basically exactly what I was talking about in the, in the shop, right? It's just a, a place yeah. to run wires and put some sheetrock. That's it. You know? Yeah. So like if you, uh, if you're going to run electrical, you're going to finish the space at all. As soon as you start using wood, you've got to come up to building code for f framing in wood. Right. And so there is a requirement for spacing and depth and how to run your wiring and the kind of screws you use. If it's, I mean, it, it, if you're going to touch it, it's in the code. It's, it's exhaustive. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Look at that. No one's calling with an, another solution. Maybe I'm right. <laughs> Maybe you just need a couple of fans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, go for it. That'd be awesome. All right. Now, I don't know, Brad, how much time did we to say we wanted to run this show for? We mentioned about an hour. I don't want to take you away from your wife and kids. It's almost dinner time. You in the yeah. same time? Is it six o'clock where you are? Uh, no, it's actually five five o'clock. Oh, you're an hour behind us. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, let's do this. Let's do three more questions and then we'll call it a day. All right. Sounds great. All right, Maddie. What are some easy, cheap things you can do to improve your house's value? Mm. Wow. That one. I, I think that the one that the ones that I always go to that. The cheapest and the easiest for me always is paint. Yeah. Because yeah. like when you go to, it, it's so funny how like, well, I'll see if we'll be like in a house or I'll, I'll hear somebody talking about like, they'll go to look at a house and they'll be like, I don't like the paint colors. And I'm like, that's what your takeaway was. It was like the paint colors. Like, yeah, <laughs> no one knows. That's why it's still houses. for sale. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Negotiate off that. Yeah. Right. I mean, like yeah. that, that, yeah. So like, if you're looking to sell like in that there's this one shot my wife and i were cracking up because like I, I purposely stood there in it's like in the kitchen kind of looking out towards the front door and there's this like baby blue and this like pea soup green and then this like you know autumn red and i'm like oh gosh that's like, a lot know, of colors in the same line of sight it is right wow. and like if that was wow. all like agreeable gray like then it's yeah. just a, then it's just a non-conversation like no nobody nobody says oh i hate this gray they just say right it's it's a blank it's a blank slate but the, that, the yeah. basic and sorry then, the, the, uh, and then just fixtures i think is the other easy one you that know, is light, a good point fixtures, fixtures have great return lighting fixtures and and faucets those are yep. like, as far as the easiest and cheapest those would be my three nice i was going to say because on your project you're talking about uh, doing something with the color of the brick yes okay so you were looking for a masonry stain not a big yes. I said, yeah, I, I saw, I don't know if you commented that or I saw you talking about it somewhere. I saw that. Um, yeah. What's your feeling on masonry? Oh no, I was watching you. I did it. I, I, I sprayed my church. You painting the brick. You were like painting it yep. brick by brick and it was going from like a red to a brown. Um, no, we actually used a paint sprayer and we did a masonry stain on an entire church project. Oh, okay. Maybe I, I thought you were. Yeah. Like, I was watching a ton of videos. but <laughs> no, no, I, I'm, I'm sure you were, but. Like, at the bottom of the end of the day, there's two products. One, it sits on the surface and it skins. Yeah. And the skin is subject to um, wear and tear, UV, and all kinds of other stuff, right? Including right. weather and frost, if you get a little bit of frost. Um, but the masonry stain, it goes into the masonry, stains it, and then it sits there, and it's not a skin. It sits inside the material. Yeah, yeah. And so you can change the color. It's a really easy process. All you got to do is go do a Google search for like a Sherwin-Williams or a PPG store and put in commercial paint store near me. Yeah, because they have they have residential stores and com they have a, a commercial store in every city. Gotcha. Okay, and they don't they don't advertise it or brand it as such. They just call, "Hey, I'm Sherwin Williams." Right. So if you Google the commercial store, it'll give you the address. They'll have all those next tier commercial and industrial products on the shelves, and they'll be able to get you something that'll uh, float your boat for sure, dude. How do you feel about uh, lime wash? I've never done it. I don't really have an opinion. I mean, I get the idea. It's it's uh, it's copacetic because it allows the brick to breathe. Same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, same thing with the stain because it doesn't skin. It still allows right. it to breathe. Yeah, that's that's yeah. what. Uh, and because we're we're wanting to go white ish, that's definitely the first one. But yeah, I don't know. Do they have on the stain side? Do they go that light? Do they have like um, white? That'd be a light? question for that'd be a question for the guy at the store. I'm Come sure on. that yes, all of them start. All the, all of, all them, all the yeah, I don't know stuff everything. Stuff. As <laughs> they all start with a white base. So <laughs> you probably you go, could man. just get it right out of the can yep. and uh, find yourself a little tint magic on there, you know, make it cloud white or something if you want. Yeah. 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 
<laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. <laughs> Let's get one more question in here, Matt. There we go. After being in our home for 50 years, my wife and I would like to build a porch. Mm. Our house is a colonial style. Is that a DIY project? Can this project actually add to the value of the house? Mm. You know what? Let's talk about value first, and then Brad, I'll let you talk about the process if, you, if you've got experience with that. First of all, um, anytime you do something that enhances curb appeal, you're looking at about a 70 to 80% return on your investment if you hire a contractor. And right now, contractors are running twice as expensive as they were four years ago. And so you're getting a really good return if you do it yourself. So for every dollar you put in materials, you're going to get three to four back depending on where you live. Okay, that's the basic rule. I was going to mention this too. When you paint your house, you increase the house value by 5%. Bam, mm -hmm. done. Same when you paint the inside. So when we're talking about cheap ways to fix things, mm -hmm. great return investment. Now, making a colonial porch. To the best of my understanding, that means you're putting down wood and you're going to be priming it with a flat oil and then painting the surface as well, right? That's a lot of labor of love and you're going to get five to 10 years, of, but don't cheap out on your paint. What about the construction technology? I mean, I'm in a four season climate. This, this person who asked the question, we don't know where they live, obviously. But when you're building like porches and decks and that sort of stuff down in Tennessee, do you guys have code for how deep you got to put your footings? Uh, yes. Yeah. And that's so, I'm, and I don't, I've not done one. I've done a lot of repair on decks and porches, but I'm, You're not, right. <laughs> I'm not actually put the, I actually put the footers in, but we've been thinking about the same thing. We've been thinking because we have um, a, a back deck that is covered and we're like, you know, we, it's, it's, it's like one of those sizes where it's just like, it's big, but not so big where you can put like another piece of furniture or something else. Just, just like a little bit extra room. So we've been thinking about, about doing that. And, hmm. and I've, you know, watched a lot of YouTube videos on that. And I think the same thing like what that you just said, it's like, as long as you know the code. So is it a DIY project? Absolutely. You can do it. There's, you go out there, there's probably hundreds of videos on people making porches or decks. Now the colonial style, that's a different thing. Like depending upon how detailed you want to go into the trim and what the house looks like and all that good stuff. Right. Um, Are you going to be turning wood for your posts and everything right, else? Right? Yeah. yeah. If, that, if that stuff <laughs> is even available, but but yeah, as far as the, the project goes, but like what you said, I think the biggest thing for me when I think about outdoor projects is the maintenance. And you think about like, how do you get as low maintenance as possible? Hmm. And that's also why I really like the idea of the lime wash or potentially the stain, because like when you, when you throw paint on something, you know, you, you start to watch, right? And then depending yeah, on what quality yeah. paint you use, like you're going to have to maintain it. That's just a given and it's going to crack or peel or whatever. And so a porch is going to take the worst of it, right? So you, you want to have the best quality you can have. So I'm totally with you on that. And that's, you know, something that you're going to be maintaining for the rest of your life. Right. So like if you wanted to do a porch, I think that the process is simple. Um, if it's a colonial home, you, chances are you're, you're more northern. You're going to get some winter weather, not a lot of colonial in the south, right? So you can build onto your house, but you have to have a and the extension has to be whatever the building code in your area is as far as a footing in the ground. Now, it doesn't have to mean you're pouring concrete. It could be a helical pile, which is a point load with a big disc. Those are great options now for extending your structure. But you, if you're going to do something like that, you're going to do it on permit. So make sure you contact your building officer. Find out what your permit requirements are. Hire whoever it is to draw it if you can't do it yourself. And then build according to your drawings and get your inspections because the value on your home it all comes back down to, was this a permitted project? So is it done right with the right mm -hmm. materials, with the right design, so it'll last? Otherwise, whatever you build doesn't add value. It actually creates a problem because the next homeowner goes, okay, well, how, how long is that going to last? Am I going to come home one day and fall through the floor, right? Like <laughs> this, it actually is like, it's like a crisis because it's like, do we have to open this up and have it inspected? One of the biggest problems people have is they buy something that wasn't done on permit and then they go and ask a permit officer to do an inspection and find out if it was done right. But then they get a work order from the city. You got to fix it. Yeah. So oh, just yeah. follow the rules. Find out where you live. Talk to your building officer. They're happy to answer questions, guys. They're here to help you out. Be successful. And remember that whatever you do along that path of building that, you're making money if you're doing it yourself. You're not spending it. You're making it. Okay. All yeah. right. Brad, this has been awesome. Thanks for Absolutely. coming and joining us today. I'm looking so forward to meeting you in, in uh, is it Dallas or Houston? Dallas. We're going to Texas. Dallas. Texas somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go to Dallas and we'll meet up and that'll be fun. 
And anyway, um, if you guys got questions and make sure you check out his video, right? Support him on this journey. How many years do you think you're going to be doing that renovation before you can move your family in? That do you have like case. a... I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like two. You before you can move. move. Yeah. 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 Because you don't want to move in in the dust. Right. And we're doing the shop first. So like there's a whole thing there. And they, like, you well, know, that's what I was thinking, right? We're you can't build a kitchen stuff, if you don't build your shop. <laughs> exactly. Shop first, house second. Yes. All right. Make sure you guys sign up and, and subscribe to his channel. Join him on his journey. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, he's fun to watch. And he is a smart guy, right? And so he's going to run into all kinds of challenges. And we can all learn from it. And that'll be awesome. And if you've got solutions to his problems as we go along, then jump into the chat and uh, help a brother out. Brad, thanks a lot for joining us today, buddy. I really right, appreciate you. you. So appreciate your channel. Um, and, and say hi to your wife for us. We appreciate everything she does to help make sure that you stay on YouTube and, and keep this truck a running. All right. Uh, oh, guys, man. if you have other questions, you know, hit us up. Um, join his Patreon. Uh, join my membership channel, my membership program channel. My goodness, my tongue's not working. It's time to hang up. All right. Dude, thanks again. Cheers. Till next time. Absolutely. All right, guys. See you later. Bye-bye.